Right. My name is Harry, uh, Harry Naya. I'm the executive chair of this company. And I have to tell you, I'm very thrilled to see so many people here. Uh, if we've got some very uh, share of these people like Basim uh, and Mustafa, who actually was here a long time before everyone else joined in. And uh, right now, with the number of shareholders that we have, we've got about something close to about 600 shareholders here. Yeah. And it is actually growing. So let me start the official part of this particular meeting. Now, before I do that, a couple of things. This particular meeting uh, is going to be recorded. So this is so that it will be put on the web. Uh, it's uh, obviously live. Uh, we are going to have votes. The votes that you have already put in as uh, uh, proxies will obviously have already been tabulated. The people in this room can vote with a show of hands, right? And then uh, we uh, will have an informal part of the presentation where John and I can actually give you a presentation on where we are, what we've done. And we, I think we've also got a couple of some very nice announcements today yes. as well. But uh, firstly, let me introduce you. To, you know my uh, partner in crime, uh, John. Uh, and then, of course, a, uh, Janet Bowen, who is on our board, but she's also the chief of our regulatory and quality area as well. And then uh, there's Leighton Hopper, who is our company secretary. Leighton is also the CEO of our consumables group. And th this is the company that actually manufactures the membranes and the cartridges and things like that. So for the first part of the meeting, uh, let me just say that we have got four resolutions. Resolution number one. Okay, let me just do this. Is just the financial statements, which I should have done. I apologize. To receive and consider the annual financial reports of the company for the financial years ended 30 June 2021 and 30 June 2022, together with the declaration of directors, the director's report the remuneration report and the auditor's report for those financial years. So that's been placed in front of the body here. Uh, this is a, a, for a discussion only uh, item. So are there any questions about as far as the accounts are concerned? Uh, I, I'm taking it that I can then move on. All right. All right, the next one is the resolution of a director. I will now pass that over to you. Thank you very much, Harry. Moving on to this next resolution. This resolution is resolution to re-elect a director, Professor Harry Nair, and to consider his thought fit to pass the following resolution as an ordinary resolution. That, Professor Harry Nair, a director who retires in accordance with the company's constitution, and being eligible offers himself for re-election as a director of the company, effective immediately. Now, I do have some proxies for this. We have proxies for this resolution of 29,598,697 shares for. There are none against, and there are 4,000 discretionary shares. Um, so, any questions on this resolution before I put it to the vote? Okay, all those in favour say aye. aye. Any who say nay? Motion passed. All right, let me pass the cudgel back to you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's an honour to have not only founded this company, but to serve this company. And I, I, I've got to say, uh, Having undergone a, a knee replacement about seven days ago, I feel the pain. So, <laughs> the next resolution is the re-election of uh, Director Mr. John Manusa. And I'll read this resolution out to you. Uh, to consider and if thought fit, pass the following resolution as an ordinary resolution. That Mr. John Manusa, a director who retires by rotation in accordance with the company's constitution and being eligible, offers himself for re-election as a director of the company effective immediately. Uh, I have 59 proxies that uh, have been given to me and I will vote all those proxies in, in, in favor of this resolution. And in terms of the proxies, we've got 29,559,000 uh, 
uh, 197 for uh, 4,000 discretionary. Uh, before I put this up for a vote, are there any questions, any, any points of discussion? For all those in favor? Okay. All those against? So this resolution is carried. Thank you very much. The next resolution is again a re election of a director, Ms. Janet Boat. And again, I'm going to read this out so that this is all official. To consider and, if thought fit, to pass the following resolution as an ordinary resolution. Uh, Order okay. resolution uh, uh, that Miss Janet Bowen, a director who retires by rotation in accordance with the company's constitution and being eligible, offers says himself, but I think we all know that she's <laughs> herself for re election as a director of the company effective uh, immediately. Now, again, I'd like to open this up for any discussion. Yeah. Again, I've got 59 proxies that have been allocated to. Uh, Ms. Bowen, uh, uh, 29,590,505 for Ms. Bowen, none against, and then a discretionary 4,000. Again, I'd like to put this resolution up for a vote. All those in favor? Uh, all those against? So, oh, Janet, congratulations. So, this resolution is carried. Now, the final resolution uh, is the issue of shares, unexercised options to consider fit. Now, to consider and if thought fit to pass the following resolution as an ordinary resolution that the shareholders of the company approve the allotment and issue of up to four million four hundred and fifty five thousand four hundred and thirty three fully paid uh, ordinary shares in the company at an issue price of ten dollars per share representing the potential shortfall in unexercised options which are due to expire on 31 March, 2023, and otherwise issued on the terms and conditions set out in the explanatory statement. Now, um, again, I, as I said, I have uh, proxies for this. 29,507,268. Sorry, numbers. The numbers, the numbers are different. Yeah, it's the latest in there. Uh, and then there, there, there's a, a 28,692 against, right? 13,000 discretionary. Uh, again, is there any discussion on this? So I put this to a vote. All those in favor? Aye. All those against? So this is now carried. So the official part of this, formal part of this meeting is now over. Now, um, uh, just before I do close, I, I want to uh, thank everyone here for being present. I, I, it's one of the, the loneliest jobs in the world is that of a CEO. Uh, and the reason for that is that you get a lot of brickbats. But when you have the sort of support that we are seeing here today, it, it shows me that uh, you must have done something right. And that this company is actually going to a Point any of this, uh, we, we, we are heading towards uh, some very, very uh, historical heights. And uh, I'd like to thank all those people here who have supported us. And, uh, and I'd like to also thank my staff, who uh, some of them are here, but uh, without them, uh, John and I would not have been able to achieve this. Good. We'll formally close this uh, formal part of the meeting at 10 past 10. Now let's talk about this uh, presentation. Now, this is a very informal presentation. So if you feel like interrupting and asking questions, please do, all right? Um, oh, and we'll try and answer the questions as best as possible. Now, I'll start this off and I, you know, my I, one thing I know about my business partner here, he's not shy, so. Uh, <laughs> well, I think I want to do the uh, medical part and you can do the financial part. <laughs> Uh, the, the, there is a shortage of immunoglobulins globally. And you can ask anyone that you want, uh, any of the major uh, plasma fractionators will tell you the same thing. The solution to this shortage, there are only two solutions. One is you increase the collection of plasma. So you go around, and by the way, there are two ways of increasing the collection of plasma. 
you can bleed the guy to death, which you can't do, right? Or you get more people to donate. Now, the system that we have uh, does not allow you to do that. And also, there's only a finite number of uh, people that you can donate, uh, get donations of plasma from. So the only alternative is to increase process yields. There have been a number of uh, ideas that have been put forward, but for about 90 years, there hasn't been a technology that virtually increases process yield. And the hemofrac is it. Hemofrac doesn't only increase process yields, and I want to make this very clear to everyone, it actually doubles the yield. And that is what is denied impossible for 90 years. Right. Now, uh, we, we've done, we've had a, a number of things that we did last year. And the one thing that we are both really proud of is, it's not us just saying, we're going to do this, you know, right? We've actually achieved this, right? Firstly, TGMP approval of a hemofrag process, the significance, the first time in a very, very long time ever, a, uh, a, a plasma fractionation process has been approved by the Therapeutics and Goods Administration. That is, that is a huge achievement. We successfully completed- It also validates the technology. I think that's something that we constantly get. You know, when are you guys going to validate your technology? That's what it is. You have a government, a regulator is part of a government. A government has looked at our process and they have said, you are consistently making the same product and it is at the appropriate pharmacopoeia level. It is approved as a process. The only thing between that and a sale of a product is to show that the product produced by that process actually does something of um, medical value, which is what the clinical trial is. The next part of it is successfully com uh, completing the first arm of the clinical trial. Now, a lot of people say, well, you know, all you've done is you've taken convalescent plasma, put it through uh, into a patient, so what? Well, it is significant. Significant because what we've done is we've taken the hyperimmunes which are floating in your body and my body after COVID, and we've actually looked to see whether it does something, and it does. It increases the ability of our plasma to neutralize COVID antibodies in a big, big way. I'm talking about significance levels that the medical fraternity has not seen before. Big achievement. It also shows that you can actually infuse plasma, hyperimmune, into normal human beings. The person doesn't die. That is very important. <laughs> so... Then it's a question of manufacturing the clinical uh, trial material. Now, Janet, yeah, I, I give Janet a hard time because I have to, uh, but she's my regulatory person and she's the policeman uh, around here. I can show you okay. Janet gives a hard time. Janet, yes. Janet, Janet gives it back in, in droves, let me tell you. But the point that we're trying to make here is that the, in order to manufacture one man, uh, clinical batch, one clinical batch takes days and days and days, and it takes tests and tests and tests. And until Janet and I can sit in a room and we go through each test and we say, and I said this to, I think, some of our early shareholders, and I'll, I'll say this again, until I know that I can give this to my daughter or my, my wife, who both are here, by the way, uh, uh, you know, uh, and, and, and it, it is safe, I will not release it. Janet won't release it. And I think that's where we, 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 we've gone into, but we have actually finished uh, manufacturing clinical trial uh, uh, batches regular. We're not talking about just one batch, but regular. Right? And then uh, the other thing was everybody was saying, oh, yeah, guys, you, know, you gotta keep talking about getting government support. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have got <laughs> financial support, which we can't talk about because the government thinks that if we tell you how much they put in, then they might have to put in the same amount of money to other, uh, other projects as well. So financial support and also other uh, forms of support, uh, logistics, uh, Department of Health, you name it, support to build a facility in Queensland. The only condition that the Queensland government has uh, put into this is you've got to build in Queensland. Right? And uh, everybody here is either from out of town or, uh, and I'm a New South Welshman myself, the new South, uh, South Wales government is a bloody waste of time when it comes to supporting projects like this. I'm not kidding you, we've tried. 
Uh, we've gone in there, we've told them, uh, we've, uh, and now we've got the elections coming, we've still had absolutely no movement. Mm. Queensland government, on the other hand, has bent over backwards. They've actually come in and they've supported us, and they've supported us in, in, in a myriad of ways. So uh, just moving on, uh, the, 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 the first dosing of COVID-19, I believe. So we manufactured, we isolated the antibodies, and then we put it into a patient. And now, why is that significant? Because every time we do something, uh, we have people coming in saying, well, what about this? Well, this is a hyperimmune, which we've put into the human being. Uh, no side effects, uh, perfectly uh, a smooth uh, trial that, that for that one subject. We have two more to do, and we will do it. The reason why we are stuck here at the moment, I use the word stuck very loosely, is because of whether we like it or not, Christmas came in and Australia goes to sleep. And when, when, when that happens, uh, there are no, there's no recruitment, there's nothing that happens at the hospital level. So we've had to now remanufacture and that has been submitted for testing. You know, uh, uh, hopefully we will get the, the test results uh, uh, approved and over the next uh, four to six weeks, we'll be able to then inject again the, 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 the two uh, extra subjects that we need. But the most important thing here is we actually put in a manufactured product into a human being. That human being had no adverse reactions whatsoever. So for want of a, a, another description, guess what, our product works. Right now, and I'll show you it works even better once we get the results out, because we've been asking uh, the uh, CMO uh, to actually analyze that one patient so that we can actually talk to our shareholders about it. I have no doubts in my, my, my head that we will show high levels of uh, neutralizing antibodies, but that's something we have to do. Okay, so what, and this comes back to, we have some core values which are very important to us as individuals and for this company. And one of them is delivery. And last year we set down some targets. We said we will um, undertake to get the 1 million litre facility back by government. And we will begin the second arm of the uh, common year trial, both of which we hit before the end of the year. So each time we have said we'll do something, we'll actually achieve it. And that is very important to us, that we achieve our targets on time. We have two targets for this year, which are complete the uh, common year clinical trial and secure first contracts. They are the only two things that we are focused on for this year. The IPO is something which will happen, I believe, by the end of this calendar year, but it is not one of our goals that is an outcome of achieving our goals. So um, you want to talk to the Columbian trial? Well, I think I, I, I've already done that. Okay. I think that, you know, it's on the way and we will complete this and hopefully by um, uh, May of this year, we'll be able to tell you all that it's over and we'll be able to then share the uh, uh, results as well. Okay, next slide. One of the things that has come up time and time again um, is COVID is for COVID and COVID is over. It, it's gone. And we're not going to have to worry about it. So where are you going to sell your product? <laughs> I thought he was going to. <laughs> no, I just let in. You know, um, uh, do we have a slide on some the, of the yeah. announcements? Okay. Um, one of the things that has become very, very obvious to us is, firstly, COVID immune isn't dead. All right. Uh, I, 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 COVID is still prevalent out there. The U.S. government, I know, I'm talking to some of my, some of my colleagues, uh, in fact, as recently as uh, last week, uh, is going to be announcing that COVID is over, but COVID is not over. Uh, the Australian government will tell you, uh, all of you, uh, I mean, we're doing wonderful things today. We are sitting in a room without any masks. And to be honest with you, that's not what you should be doing because COVID is not over. Uh, and we will get new mutations uh, of, of COVID. And there is a requirement for something like this. But the most important group of people who we need to look after are immunocompromised people, people whose immune system do not work. If your immune system doesn't work, it doesn't matter how much vaccine I give you, that vaccine will not work. And we are working with, uh, with the universities in uh, the uh, hospitals in the US to virtually look after this group, and there is a large population of this. So no matter what happens to COVID in general, this group needs to be taken care of, and there's no viable solution 
And as long as outbreaks and mutations continue, we need COVID. There's a market and there's a very appreciable market there. So this is of our population, between three and 5% of our population. It's 3% at 750,000 people. We can only manufacture Hundred thousand liters, which gives you six hundred thousand doses. So we can't manufacture in our facility enough to cover every person who is immunochallenged in this country. Now, not even one of those people is going to require a shot of COVID co immune in a year anyway, because it's predominantly going to be the people who are on uh, chemotherapy and those sorts of things where your immune system is completely knocked out, and literally you become the, the boy in the bubble. Because if you go outside without an immunity in your in your body then you'll catch everything from the common coal through to whatever else is just floating around in the environment. That is where our product goes. Our product is the only product that we've got this video here, we'll show in a second, uh, that works now because all of the monoclonals, because of the mutations, are no longer effective. It's also been priced at the same price as the monoclonals because it does the same job as them, but it continues to be updated because we collect plasma from those who have recovered. So every time there's a new mutation that goes through, you collect plasma from those people, that is added into our pool, which is then given to people and they have the latest immunity. So it has an automatic update uh, in the system. That is the only product that does that. Monoclonals are fantastic, but they're made at a point in time and the world moves on. And that point in time hasn't changed and that's the issue. So when do you have your first trial of putting this into an, an immune compromised individual? Yes, that's something we're working on. Uh, uh, when we were dealing with the TGA, the TGA came back and basically said that the trial that we had was fantastic, but uh, could we also do a trial that included immunocompromised patients? And I can tell you as of last week, last week uh, we, had we had approval from, from the Human Ethics Committee to do exactly that. So we have, that is an extension of the trial. And one other thing we should pick up on that. Yeah, sure. yes. it comes to 15 patients, or can you just do two or three in this trial? No, so uh, it's five patients that they're looking at. So would that be instead of doing 15, you do 20? Yes. Yeah. Uh, no, it, no, no, no. We've got to do 15 plus five. Plus yeah. five is yeah. total. Which 20. is 20. Yeah. But um, it's not plus one. Hello, Hello. my name is Professor Hari Naya. I'd like to talk to you today about Covimmune effectiveness against COVID mutations and automatic update. mRNA vaccines have been our mainstay against fighting the COVID virus. However, over the last couple of years, there have been new variants that have come up and these vaccines have become less and less effective against the Omicron variant. This graphic here shows you how the vaccines have waned over a period of time starting from the Wuhan virus, then the Delta virus, and then the Omicron virus. There have been 15 registered monoclonal antibodies to tackle COVID-19. Only a single monoclonal antibody is effective against all new SARS-CoV-2 variants. And over the period of time, as you can see, starting from the Wuhan virus, which has had full coverage, down to some coverage of the Delta, and then virtually no coverage for Omicron. Significantly, our COVID immune hyperimmune is effective against all the variants. The exciting thing about this research is that we have shown that the Covimmune automatically upgrades with each new mutation. So you get a Covimmune being effective for the Wuhan virus, for the Delta virus, and for the Omicron. This is what is going to happen with future mutations as well. We are Agros, patients first through innovation. Just to give you a little bit of an update, that was 1922. It doesn't exist now. I'm not the 15 monoclonal antibodies. Anything else? So we, uh, one of the big projects that we have is the upgrade of our five Eden Park facility. Why are we upgrading? 150,000 liters, that's what we're trying to push through that facility. And we want state-of-the-art equipment, state-of-the-art processes. Uh, so uh, in June, we will be able to 
take delivery of a 100,000 liter hemofrac system. That is eight cartridges and it's a, it's a monster of a system which will go in. Uh, and this is a, a huge leap from where we were just uh, even from right now. And the renovations of the facility layout uh, will be completed by July, August of this year. And then the TGA will come in again and they will look at uh, licensing us with the new equipment. Now, just so that everyone uh, knows, and I think there is a slide uh, to this effect, yeah. we have an open day on Monday next week. So Monday 14th, we have an open day. The whole idea there is so that uh, shareholders can actually walk through our facility. You, you won't be able to go into the clean room areas, but we will show you what we're going to be doing to the new facility over there. We, you will be given an idea of the size and magnitude of this new system that we're going to be putting in. And we'll also show you what our R&D pipeline holds as well. So it, it's good. It, I think it's a, it's a worthwhile exercise. If you can make it to please come in and have a look. But this is what the machine itself, the one that is being built for us right now. So this is a graphic of what it's look, it will look like. Obviously it's being built. It is being built oddly enough in uh, Spain. Yep. Um, that's not at a fractionator who's based in Spain. It is actually a engineering group happening to be based there. What a great thing. So the walkthrough literally shows you that there are eight uh, cartridges, uh, cartridge holders. Uh, it is fully compliant with uh, GMP uh, regulations. It is controlled by computer. Uh, we have spent a lot of time in looking at vessel structure, etc. The inside of our clean room has had to be opened up so that we can actually put this monster in. And you'll see that, uh, it, uh, you know, it, I, I think somebody, Monty Python, once said it's not just an instrument which goes bing, it actually does something. <laughs> and it really is very exciting. That's it, nine meters long, just to give you an indication. It so will it's... actually do about 150,000 meters, yes. but it's engineered to do 100. There are tweaks that we can make so that it'll get up to 150,000. So this section you're seeing here is where those cartridges go. And you can see there's a divide there between two plates. That's where our cartridge goes, and then these clamps close, um, and the system becomes operational. You're saying it's a monster. If you're talking 100,000 litres a year, yes. compare that to CSL's footprint. Um, oh, it's a fraction. Well, yeah. well, don't worry about CSL's footprint. Think about the 1 million litre facility you're talking about in Queensland. So this is 150,000 litres, multiply that by 10. That's so, how big it is. I'm saying it's not a huge space. No, no, oh, no it's, not. it's not. So it's... the Queensland facility is roughly 20,000 square metres of clean room area, which compares to over 100,000 for the Baxalta or Takeda is now facility they set up in Georgia. So it's roughly 20% of Just, the area. Yeah, I mean, look, we, we can talk technical detail if you want, but, you know, that, they'll probably only turn me on. But if you have a look at those uh, cylinders there, you can actually... Organize a cylinder either in a cylindrical circular fashion, which then becomes the main hub in the middle, or you can extend it. So there are various things that we will do looking at the Queensland facility. This is real. Yeah. Right. You know, a long time ago, people were asking whether the technology is real. This is real. This is actually being currently put together. And we are going to be doing a factory acceptance test uh, sometime in May. 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 Yeah. So this is uh, this will be then transported to Sydney in July and fully installed by July uh, August. August. So this is this is something that in the future when you come in you can actually see. Yeah. Uh, it's a lot bigger than that one. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. The other thing about it though, where those clamps are, it's that cartridge you see there. So we've standardised on that, and that's what we will be using for every scale. The, the cartridge modifications are minute, but enough so that you can make this giant. Yeah. The membranes are kept under your own umbrella here, are they? Yes. Because that's yeah. your yeah. That doesn't change. change. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't right. change. So one of the things that we want to announce, and uh, we may have seen a number of videos of myself opening the city in Springfield. It was a bull guy out there, wasn't it? <laughs> the, I thought it was you. Uh, <laughs> The Springfield facility, the Springfield facility, expected the development application approval will be by June of this year, and we should break ground in Q4 of this particular year. So, this is, this is something John and I have been working on for quite some time. There was no 
So um, I have to also compliment the, uh, the, the people at Springfield uh, Construction Group. Uh, they have been very uh, good at working with us ultimately and making this happen. Oh yeah, and look, this is a win for everyone. It's a win for us, obviously, because we get there on the pace that we can afford to be there. It's a win for them because we are the cornerstone of that whole bio park. It's a win for the, uh, uh, for the universities as well who want to put some facilities in this area. And they were saying to us, we were up there two weeks ago, we won't go there unless there is a industrial partner and you're it. So it's a win for everyone. So next slide. Yeah. Uh, before we go on to this one, uh, this is what you're going to see here, and, and this is a, a, a legacy uh, building. Yeah. On top of this, we will fund a chair in bioseparation science. Bioseparation science is something that is a very nebulous sort of area. That's the, the, you know, the, the first thing that came out uh, in terms of plasma fractionation has come out after 90 years. So we will actually fund a bioseparation chair out there and establish a global center for bioseparations research, which will be uh, an good. adjacent building to this one as well. And this uh, particular project, uh, we've, John and I have had uh, negotiations with the University of Queensland, uh, with uh, Queensland uh, uh, University of Technology, Griffith sure. University, all the universities over there, but also universities here in uh, New, uh, New South Wales, it will also be in collaboration with major universities around the world. So this is going to also put a real stamp of excellence mm -hmm. as far as ABROS, its technology. And the one thing that the ABROS founders, uh, and I say this to, uh, to my staff all the time, don't get married and don't get uh, fall in love with the technology, right? Leave that with your, your wife at home, uh, but just make sure that you don't fall in love with your technology. If you fall in love with your technology, you cannot innovate. And innovation is what this company is offering. So this is a, a very green building. Well, all those who may not have worked out, you'll see the DNA strand right at the top. And you'll find that the pylons are actually a manifestation of our, our logo, which is the antibody. And it, uh, there's flow throughs in the building. It's green, it's got uh, solar panels. It'll, uh, you know, we're trying to get to zero carbon, I, you know, you can always try, uh, but uh, it, it really is a fun of the building. The upstairs part is uh, actually open, and so the air conditioning is not required, except on incredibly hot days. So it's those sorts of attention to detail that we have uh, brought about. Obviously, it's solar panels on the roof, and the roof itself will actually be a water catchment area as well. So it'll then funnel it down into our grey water supply. So that blue building on the side, on the right side, is where the manufacturing block is. And as much as we'd like to make uh, the headquarters look lovely, the manufacturing block has got to be square so that the uh, regulators are happy with the windows, and with the exposure to the outside and all that sort of stuff. So uh, uh, this is also the first biopharmaceutical biotechnology building in the Springfield area. And this is the cornerstone uh, 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 project that is bringing in many, many projects in that area. So this is number one. We've also got uh, the Mata Hospital with 500 beds there. Uh, we've got uh, uh, two chairs from the uh, University of Southern Queensland, uh, two chairs from the University of Queensland itself. So th this, this is all going to be part of this superstructure. And you can see the logo uh, in the walkway as you go in. Okay. We've built that in. This is a statement. Yes. So we'll just wait for that to finish. I don't think we go down. There is an uh, auditorium at the bottom of the open area there as well. I don't think we actually go to that. Maybe we do. And again, the, the atrium is so that it's exposed to the outside. There's been a lot of studies as well done environmentally. We've been looking at waste management. Uh, it'll generate 500 jobs. It'll generate 3,500 indirect jobs. I think it will be the benchmark for logistics because Queensland does not have logistics for plasma fractionation. 
uh, you know, we are now talking about oh, uh, working together with DHL or FedEx and, and people like that as well. This is a huge project. This is not a small project. Well, it's a half a billion dollar project by the time. Yeah. So it is not small by any stretch of the imagination. Well, if that doesn't make us all proud to be part of it, we're never going to be proud. Yeah, very true. But excellent. Okay. Uh, and this comes back to the question I was going, I was being asked here about Intel. Uh, we've mentioned on a number of occasions that uh, we were approached by a fractionator and we thought a fractionator uh, has woken up to the fact that we are game changing with our yield. So when they approached us, we said, okay, there's no point having an auction of one. So let us have a real auction. And we engage with Macquarie Bank. So, uh, we are engaging with not only fractionators, with industry participants who would like to get into this market space. And they are well done that process now in the, as they call it, educational phase. What has happened is that the interest has increased dramatically as we achieve our milestones. First of all, there was the clinical trial results from the first half, which showed that plasma products can be useful. That was a big first. The second one was signing off on the uh, Queensland facility, because if you have a million litre facility, you are now in the same league as all of the first tier fractionators. No one else has that capacity. And then finally, when our first uh, patient was dosed successfully, it says that this product is going to work and therefore it is going to be a very valuable product for us to take to market. So it makes the case for what we're doing very clear to the existing fractionators. We expect this to be completed sometime later in this year. It's a process that will take its own time. We're not gonna rush it because we wanna get the most value. We've talked about this being $100 million for 10%. The valuation has been updated recently, uh, which is something that Alex has done. And it is, I'm not going to put a number out in a public arena like this, because this will be in a public arena, but it is a number well north of that. And as a result, so will the price that this strategic investor will have to pay, because as we become more relevant, closer to the market, they have to pay the price. So, so if you spread, spread out into the world, yep. um, you'll be selling the membrane? it'll become a uh, continuous cash flow because every batch of product that they make in whatever plant we're talking around the world will require a new cartridge. Mm -hmm. So it's a constant stream. It is a product in itself for one of our businesses. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and obviously that needs to be protected. Now, uh, as I said, 40th March, please put it in your calendar. Come down here to the ground ground floor of uh, Eden Park Drive. There is a, a, a batch of new offices that are just being completed, and I think we're going to get the federal MP from Bennelong yeah. to come along and cut a ribbon. 11:30 to 1 p.m. Uh, there will be presentations from R and D Medical and the Engineering uh, Company. We do need RSVPs because of the numbers that are required. We because it's a regulatory yeah, facility, we can't just bring everyone in. Uh, and light refreshments will be provided. And I, I really would encourage all of you to take the time and come and see us. More than the fact that we'd like to show you what we have achieved, uh, you should actually look at this and be very proud of the company that you have invested in. Anything Parking. else? Parking? Parking for the event next Monday? Parking. Street parking. Street. I'm afraid at the moment yeah, yeah. it has to be street, street parking, parking because there street really isn't any. Just on the road outside. Catch the train is all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, th th this is a nice segue to this last slide. And, and uh, it's also the quality of people we got coming in. Damien Thornton uh, is actually a, a very competent process engineer uh, and worked for some of the major companies uh, internationally. And right now he's the CEO for engineering and the interim CEO for uh, therapeutics. And we are looking at hiring somebody for the therapeutics area. Uh, Leighton uh, uh, Hopper, who uh, has have, ha held many CEO positions, uh, you know, and he's a chemist in his own right. So again, the quality of the individuals, and we also have people like Alex, uh, you know, with his uh, finance background, uh, Stephen Marler, who's our, our chief scientific officer. And very recently, we also have uh, uh, Dr. Leon Rosen, 
who is our chief medical officer in Leon, was formerly one of the medical directors for CSL. So those are the sort of people who are coming in, and they're coming in because of where the company is. And that's and what that's the point. So that's the end of our uh, presentation. Yep. And uh, all right. Well, I think we might uh, in that case, close the meeting. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you for you. coming. Yeah. And uh, uh, that's it, isn't it? That's it. Uh, yeah. Thank you, everyone. And then hopefully, we'll see you next week. Yes.